The following program is made possible in part by a grant from the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation, Making a Difference in Arkansas. The United States of America imprisons more people than any other country in the world. Over 1.9 million men and women are currently locked up in our nation's prisons and jails. They are the invisible members of American society with invisible families. They do not see us in here. They just, they get a glimpse of it or they throw us out and they forget us, you know, out of sight, out of mind. That's not helping the state, that's not helping the women, and that's not helping the children of the state, most of all. And it's a population growing out of control. There is not enough money in our budget to keep up with the rate of growth. We can't build our way out of this. Women are now the fastest growing segment of the prison population, and the majority of them are mothers. Their children are most likely to become our next generation of prisoners. Growing up wasn't exactly easy for me. My parents have been in and out of jail or prison mostly my whole life. Starting school was harder for me than anything in the world. I had to go to school knowing that when I came home from school, I wasn't going to see my mother's face. So every day I cried myself to sleep, hoping that just one day out of my life, my mother was going to be at home when I came home from school. In most ways, Camilla Hayes is an average teenager. But beneath her smile lies the story of a family racked by substance abuse and incarceration. For most of her life, Camilla has moved back and forth between different family members while her mother was in prison. Today, she lives with her grandmother, Estella Brown. I wanted my mama there. I wanted my mom and my daddy to be together. I just kind of held it inside, so people was like, okay, just got the perfect little life, and I don't. I have it so hard. I mean, I grew up rough, a rough childhood. I mean, it was not easy for me. It was hard. I was staying with my grandma, and people were threatening her, telling them that they were going to put us in a foster home. And it was just hard for me because I couldn't concentrate in school. I, my grades was falling, and with my mom being locked up or whatever, and me unable to talk to her. It's like every time somebody told us it was going to be okay and things would get better, it only got worse. Camilla isn't in this alone. It's estimated that there are over 40,000 children in Arkansas with a parent in the correctional system. The rise in the female prison population in America sharpens concern about what happens to the children on the outside. McPherson Prison in Newport is the only facility in the state for female inmates, housing nearly 700 women. I think that they, that the differences between men and women incarcerated are as obvious as the difference out on the street. They are truly two very distinct populations. Many of these women have children on the outside, and a lot of them were active mothers, at least as active as they could be at that point. And they still want to be involved in those children's lives. Unfortunately, on the male side, you don't always see that. A lot of times the males may have children, but they may have been absent fathers, and oftentimes the, that doesn't change when they're incarcerated. But with the females, if you're a mom on the outside, when you get here, you're still a mom. And oftentimes you are trying very much to be a better mom.
we range here at the McPherson unit on all types of crimes in Arkansas, from uh, writing bad checks all the way up to murder, murder one. My job is to make sure that we offer programs and get inmates involved in programs so they can improve uh, their outlook once they get out, even if they're going to be here for life. You want those type of inmates also trying to, to get into programs to change their attitude. So our job is try to get that female back out to raise her children to try to slow them down from committing crimes. The increase of women inmates has both the corrections and child welfare systems looking for ways to break the cycle of incarceration. One of the programs specifically addresses the issues of parental incarceration and tries to strengthen a mother's commitment to her children while she's inside. This is parenting from prison. It is hard to go home to your children and pick those pieces back up, but they need you. They need you badly. And so many of your children are, are truly traumatized. If you were asked, you know, what, what's the most traumatic thing you could do to your child, to a, any child? It would be to take their, their parent away, their, their caregiving parent. I need to tell you a few just reality facts. Five to six times greater risk that your children will be prisoners in their future by virtue of having a parent in prison. But the truth is, if you go into juvenile detention and you say to those kids, how many of you had a parent in prison? More than half of them will raise their hand. And one of the wonderful ways to intervene and prevent is to address parents and address parenting. And then the very special issue of a parent who's incarcerated. Because I do believe that there are things that you can do particular to your situation that will help prevent your children becoming that future prisoner. Most people, when we talk about this, will say, you know, never thought about it, never thought about the children of the defendants, the children of the convicted offender. Just didn't ever, didn't ever cross my mind. My stereotypical woman in prison was um, a hard woman, probably seen a lot, probably didn't have a lot of uh, nurturing in her because I presumed that probably she wasn't well nurtured herself. Wasn't true. Yes, there's a hardness. I, I see women develop in prison that, that is almost inevitable, but these are not hard people. It was really uh, stereotype puncturing is what I experienced. The truth is there isn't a barrier between us because we're both into the same thing. We're both mothers and we both care about our children. Maybe you didn't care as much before, but boy, when you come in here and you get sober and you get, you know, kind of you know, greater awareness of where you are, children become your priority. I've never seen it not happen. All I know out there on the streets is I've used, I've drank, and you know, I've been out there as a teenager, that's all I did was use and drink, and that's all I got used to. I truly don't know how to live out there. And when you call the war on drugs, which really began in the 70s, particularly started to impact women in the 90s. We started doing our classes for women in prison in 91. In 1994, the women were moved from Pine Bluff to Tucker, because we had too many women, it had doubled. There were about 400 women. And then in 98, four years later, we moved uh, the women to the Newport McPherson unit and the capacity went from 400 to uh, 685. And it is directly connected to the escalating drug use and addiction among women. Look at us women that get out and keep coming back because we want help for crying out. They're not helping. I started writing the checks. It was all, all my checks are the liquor stores. I got $2,000 worth of checks to liquor stores, you know. And I've done almost four years in prison for it. 
So, I don't think I would have wrote him if he wouldn't have ran off with my kids. I didn't know how to deal with that at all. I still don't know how to deal with it. Um, unfortunately, I chose to do drugs and I was in a wreck and a very dear friend of mine was hurt, was killed in that wreck and I was the driver of the vehicle. It went from drinking to marijuana, you know, and then it went from pills and it went from sniffing cocaine. And as I got older, I saw my older brother, you know, smoking crack. And I asked him to let me try it. And then he, you know, he just wigged out. He didn't want me to. But I pushed the issue and pushed the issue. You know, if you don't, somebody will, you know, and I snuck behind his back and I did it, you know, and that's where I made my mistake because even though he was doing it, he was telling me that it's a drug that you don't want to get, you know, hooked up with because it's just something that you just can't put down, you know. It's a real addiction. I'm 24 years old and I feel 50. I mean, that's just, you know, I didn't get a chance to grow up, be a kid. I mean, I didn't get a chance to be a kid. I had to grow up. And now I'm looking at a seven-year-old kid. I can remember when she was just born and now she's seven. She about this tall, she comes up to here on me. I had my child and I was with my mom and everything and I got into drugs. Well, I, had, I gave my child to my mother, so that would be the best thing for me, you know, to do, uh, you know, because that's where I feel comfortable with. That way I knew that she wouldn't get taken away from me. Okay. Well, I got into them real bad and I, well, I was neglecting my child to, to an extent of me not coming around because of how I was. I was smoking crack. It was just a real bad situation. And, um, well, uh, September the 2nd of um, 98, I called a murder charge behind smoking crack, doing drugs. I mean, because when you're on drugs, you just really don't know what's happening. That's how messed up I was. I just lost out on life, you know. I lost out on life. I was going to cosmetology school, but when I enrolled, I never did go, you know. And I said that I love my children, but I would push my children off on my mother because I wanted to go get high. When they were little kids and, you know, they used to run around the house with Bibles in their hands, you know, asking God to save me, you know, and they tr Really, they was the parent and I was the kid, you know, and they are, they wonderful, you know. I, sh I should have listened to the, the, you know, their instructions instead of me giving them instructions. They was giving them to me, but, you know, at the time I wasn't myself, you know, I was off into what Lula wanted to do and not listening to, you know, the right thing in life. Mutually respectful relationships in learning and spending time with these mothers in the parenting class, um, you get a sense of how their priorities may have been real messed up. Uh, and these are primarily women of color, women of poverty, women uh, who have been victimized by domestic violence, who have poor education. Everything is sort of dovetailing all the social ills are starting to intersect at the prison level. And I'm not sure that the public really, really understands that this is happening. To start trying to promote it. The cycle of incarceration is hard to break. Multiple generations of a single family end up in the system. Statistics show many women are likely to break parole and come back. And there is a growing number of children left behind many who fall into criminal behavior themselves. We have mothers here, fathers at other units, husbands at other units, sons across the street. Uh, there's whole family components that's locked up inside of the Department of Corrections in Arkansas. It's the same for Tennessee. Arkansas doesn't have this disease on its own, but the whole family, that's all they know. All of these women made a choice at some point. They chose to do drugs, they chose to drink, they chose not to seek help. 
They chose to stay in an abusive relationship. They made some choices that placed their children below something else. What I want people to understand is they're people too. They have feelings, they have families, they have friends. They're just not somebody standing in a white suit with a number on the front of it and a number on the back of it. They are human beings. They have made mistakes and they are in prison. And most of them at some point will go home again. You can feel sorry for them, but you can also try to retune their thinking so that the choices they make the next time aren't the same. And I think that is how we can be most beneficial to the female inmates and to their children and to their children's children. So hopefully the cycle will be broken. Not for everyone, but if it's broken just for one or two, that's a good start. Hi, Vendor, this is Dean. I'm trying to arrange for, um, through the angel tree for gifts for the children of mothers in Newport. Camilla's family is caught in that cycle of incarceration. In addition to both of her parents having been to prison, her grandmother Estella is also a former prisoner. I got busted in 1969 and I went to the Arkansas Department of Correction in Grady, Arkansas, Cummins Unit. I was there for uh, four years and uh, it, it was not easy, mm -mm. but I made the best out of it. I had a smile every morning, just like I do now. <laughs> Try to smile and be happy and be content because I knew I had my time. I knew I did something wrong. I knew I got caught. So basically, it was time to just say, hey, make it good. So that's what I did. The difference for me is I learn from everybody else's mistake. I see what they're going through now and what I've been through in the past. And I'm just basically, you know, saying I'm, I don't want to live this life. I mean, I'm tired of this life. I, I need to do something that's going to help Camilla, keep Camilla out of trouble. So. I basically, I narrowed myself down where I don't need friends. My only friend is my grandma. I mean, I, my grandma and my auntie, my friends are basically my family. So I just want to get somewhere where I don't have to just keep constantly moving from place to place. I mean, I've been going through that all my life and I'm just basically tired of it. They've been around me more than they have anybody else, you know. And I'm just glad they had a place to go. Well, you certainly see the intergenerational cycle. Grandma's been to prison and now mom, and now there are these, these children who are certainly at risk. I mean, none of these children go out intending to, you know, repeat their, their parents or their grandparents' lives, and yet it happens. I know, I know this family on a, on a personal basis, and they are sort of living, um, you know, what we are talking about, some of, of the things that are happening to them are just bespeak what is happening to a lot of these families. And there is a great deal of heart in that family to survive and to make it. Some children of incarcerated parents are sent into the foster care system, but most, like Camilla, are taken in by relatives. In Arkansas, many caregivers are grandmothers. Already on fixed incomes, they are faced with becoming parents a second time. Brenda Olive is raising her seven-year-old grandson with a unique insight into the problems facing incarcerated mothers. She was once one herself. I was just a normal wife, mother, working mother. Um, at the time, I was, uh, my husband worked for the city of Little Rock and um, I worked at the health department and I had four children and everything was just normal. Uh, my husband got sick and I had a little girl, Dina. One day she fell and uh, she came home and you know she was crying. They said she had gotten hurt now. So we went and when we went to the hospital, they found out that some vertebrates had crushed due to the fact that she had cancer. 
So with that turn of an event, my whole life changed. So she started going through chemotherapy and in and out of the hospital at the same time with my husband in and out of the hospital. Brenda's husband and daughter both died within a few months of each other. She tried to solve her financial problems by selling drugs and was caught. Now years later, her son Patrick is in prison. A lot of stuff that my children went through, I never found out until years later when Patrick started getting in trouble and we were going for counseling and stuff. And then a lot of stuff came out that had happened in the seven months that I was gone that I couldn't imagine. And that what made me get interested in working with family and children of incarcerated people because I know what mine went through in the little seven months. So you can imagine kids whose parents are gone for years. Services for our children with incarcerated parents have really been quite meager. Um, I dare say um, non-existent uh, until about the last 10 years. And it's only right now when we've had the tripled number of mothers in prison and then the tripling of their children are people really uh, beginning to try to serve these children. We don't know a lot about what kind of services they need. Uh, because the information and the research on these children is really very, very um, shallow at this point. But we do know some things about them. Brenda runs a support group called Kinship Care. It is for both the children and the caregivers, and there is no cost to attend. At this meeting, only one caregiver shows up. She has seven children. I just couldn't see just split them up because they were going to take them and take one here and there. And I said, it's all they have is family. And if you do that, they're going to grow up thinking, well, nobody loved me. There you go. They in the streets in the system mm -hmm. doing drugs or violent. A gang member saying, well, don't nobody love me. I got to take what I want. And I just couldn't see that happening. So I said, I couldn't do it. If they choose to go a different way when they get older. It's not that they didn't get the love and the attention and affection from someone that did love them. So. That was my main, my main goal, is keeping them together and see that it's more to life than just what they've seen. I meet with um, caregivers, and they're caring for these children who are family members. The kids get a chance to be together, and the caregivers get a chance to be together. And we go through parenting classes, but mainly they say they enjoy it because it's a uh, a time when they can let off what's in them through the week that they've gone through with the children because as grandparents to start over, you know, it is hard, you know, to change your, your life. You know, this is supposed to be the time when you can do the things that you want to and it's not include going to groups and to schools and things like that. My heart you know, weighs very heavy with that because I never had anyone that I could go to, you know. And even now, as old as I am, that still hurts sometimes, you know. I uh, try to um, think, you know, how good it would be to have had a mother or a father or somebody when you're going through something that you can go to for help. It has a rippling effect when we send a woman to prison. Um, and we can't just isolate her and think about nothing else in her world because it ripples out to the children, to the grandparents, to the aunts, to the uncles, um, to everybody that works with this family, to the social service agencies that have to work with the problems the children have to schools that have to deal with school problems. So it impacts all of us. We are standing on the backs of these caregivers who are taking care of these children who are sacrificing with you know, little help, and virtually no help. Um, 
And if they gave them up for, to the foster care system, it would cost us so much money and we could not handle it. We're talking about, you know, about $24 million uh, just of those children we've identified uh, of mothers in that one prison in our state. We know that different ages, different ch children have different responses to being separated from their parents. Plus, the stigma is overwhelming for many children. Um, many family members don't want the child to talk about it. So there's this kind of conspiracy of silence, if you will, that uh, keeps a child from being able to talk to people and work through some of that trauma. Um, and like I said, the stigma, they go to school and the kids say, oh, yeah, your mom's in prison. That's rough on a kid. I know that um, kids make fun of her because I'm not there to pick her up after school like they are or make her lunches. And she's asked, she's told me about that. My daughter, I haven't, I haven't heard anything about the boys, but my daughter, she said that um, she was at school and they were like, your mom is in prison, your mom is in prison. And I was just going to slap one of the girls and I said, no ma'am, you can't do that. Well, mama, they talking about you. I said, okay, but let's think about Jesus, you know, and that's all I know to talk about. That's, that's how I know to keep my kids sane out there in that world when little kids, because I told them they don't know no better. Younger children, particularly like two to six, that age group, tend to believe that the world revolves around them. And they get into that magical thinking that if I had done such and such, this wouldn't have happened. So part of what happens to those children is that they begin to feel like they're at fault somehow. And they become, can become very withdrawn, very depressed. Um, you can see developmental regression where a child is toilet training might start having problems in, that was toilet trained might start having problems in that area. I just try to explain things to them the best I can. I've sat down and told them, you know, some things about why I'm here and why I can't be with them and that it wasn't nothing that they done or nothing that they, you know, possibly could have done. That it was just me and I made a mistake and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do better. And with me being here, you know, he has to explain to the kids why I'm not there. And my little boy asked him, he said, well, why don't you just go get mommy and bring her home? And he said it just broke his heart and he, he couldn't explain why he just couldn't come up here and Connor was mad at him because he couldn't. Older kids tend to act out more. Um, and so you start to see a lot of anger. Um, and again, some of them may have been dealing with trauma for most of their lives already. Um, and so they're, they're not that happy with mom. Um, mom may have left them this time. She may have left them once before. Um, they may have had to live with several different relatives or in foster care. So their reaction is often anger and you start to see them acting out in some way. My older one started having repercussions from it. The oldest, she started having repercussions and she was in first grade and threatened to kill a girl at school and just the anger in them, in the children. And, I, you know, people used to always tell me, well, they're young, they're going to, no, it's, it's harder. Because when they're young, there's no way to explain to a two-year-old why this is happening to their life or why something's been taken. So the only way they know how to react is by, you know, crying out either with anger or whatever emotion they find first. And with my children, they found anger first. My son, I found out. Well, he has my stuff, my clothes. I found this out when I saw him.
he uh, he keeps my clothes in his closet, my shoes by his bed, my makeup and stuff. And I asked him, I said, why do you keep that in your room? And he says, well, when I wake up and I see it, I feel like you're just at work. And God, I just lost. <laughs> and remember, not everyone is the same. And Mommy is happy. You are you. I love you, Cassie, and I think of you always. And then I put one Cassie, one mommy equals two heart. I did some math problems on the bottom, so. <laughs> and now I have every confidence as well as I hope you do in your ability to make your own decisions and to be responsible on your own now as that is what you want. Just know that I thank God each and every day for this precious gift he has given our family. We were sure blessed when God gave us you. I love you very, so very much, Mom. Working with the mothers, you can hopefully impact the children in a positive way. Working with the children, you know, you can impact the mothers in a positive way. It's, it's really using that holistic approach. You know, each piece of, of the family unit, um, anything that you do impacts all the others. It matters not what day I get out. All that matters is that I'll be a better mom when I get out. That's all that matters to me, you know. In our groups, you could just hear and listen to the other mothers on how they have raised their children in the past and their relationships weren't so good. And now they have, you know, goals. This gives them goals and things that they can share with their children and gives them tools that they can take out and put in use with their children and it can be the children can benefit from it. I mean the mother's here in the classes and learning it but it's the kids that go, is going to get to get the benefit from it. Back in the 70s when I was a, an assistant warden of a prison I can't remember spending a lot of time worrying about the inmates families and so I've really come to believe that without family support while you're in prison and without dealing with family issues when you leave, women aren't going to make it. This is a baby at just 26 weeks gestation. This will make my fourth. I've got three little girls. That's her little face, and her eye, her nose, her little mouth. And that's her little hand under her chin. This one is due December 15th. Alicia Schrock had her fourth child in prison. I thought that I would get probation and be released. I went to court on August the 5th. On August the 4th, I found out I was pregnant. I went to the medical facility there at the prison at 2.30 in the morning. And, oh gosh, I don't know, I was in hard labor. And I got to the hospital about three, a little after three. And when the doctor came in, you know, they were asking me about anesthesia, the epidural. I didn't want anything because I knew how much time I had. And I didn't want to not be there for all of it. And I think I had three Tylenol while I was in labor. And um, Cassie was born at 5.36 in the morning. And at 11.50, I was back at the prison. I mean, the old days... Until 2000, um, when the policy was written by the Department of Corrections, there was no written policy. Um, in our prenatal parenting classes, which is one of the classes we have, um, there were women returning from the hospital, from delivery, six hours post-delivery. And a lot of that time was spent sleeping. If you've ever delivered a baby, you're pretty tired. 
and so the actual um, you know mother child mother infant contact was very very sparse so in the new um, written policy uh, mothers are to remain for 24 hours post delivery with their babies the concern about this on our part as, as mental health professionals is the mother making her attachment to the baby. And what I have had t women tell me is, Dan, I don't feel the same way about this baby that I did about my other children who I was with. And that sets off alarm bells. Prisons are located in rural areas, and caregivers often don't have the time, the money, or the transportation to take the children on the trip. McPherson Prison is trying a new visitation program for the women who participate in the parenting classes in the hopes of strengthening the mother-child bond. Have you seen your mom recently? Have you? How long ago? I can't remember. You can't remember? Last week? No, no. Well, no, she's excited to see you. Sharon's the leader. Volunteers bring children from around the state who would have no other way to get there. My visits are special because my family has to come from so far, so when he's here I try to think of everything I want to say, but it never fails when he leaves. I walk out the door and, and I feel like I didn't tell him anything. Make sure he knows how much I love him and that I couldn't make it here if I didn't have him. Oh, I love my children. Just because I'm here had nothing to do with my love for them. I, um, and if they're caretakers of other people's children, let those children come and be with their mother. Whether you know they like the mother or not would not be an issue. The children do love them. So let's give them a chance to not come here. Next, Goldilocks lay down on Baby Bear's bed. Ah, oh, this bed is just right, she said, and fell fast asleep. You don't know who I am, Mia? What I got made for you. No, she had it last. Are you glad to see this baby? Yes. And this this mama of yours? This is her grandmother and dad's mom. Her dad's mom? It's not your mom. Hi. But she's good there. What are you doing? She's cut. Hi, Lee. What is she calling you? Mama. Okay. Mama. My daughter said she just put prison out of her mind and it was like we was at home, you know. We was at home having dinner together and, and it was just, it was different from the regular visitation. 
We did things here that we used to do at home. We used to sing together at home. You know, it was real special. That was special. You are quite something. We're so glad you could come. Brandy's baby is now seven weeks old. Her sister-in-law brings baby Zoe to visit. That takes a big sacrifice to take someone else's child and love them, and especially a newborn. Ain't you cute, y'all? Say hi. Say hi. When you're caught up in your own everyday life and you, you seem to put the children over here on the sidelines, and I want to put my, I want to put my kids first for once. I don't, I don't want... He's got less time. My life's always been so busy with me. I've been so concerned about my own stuff over here that my kids, I never did see, <laughs> you know, the importance of just being there for them. And I just say thank you and to all the caregivers, actually, for mothers. That is, that's a big, big, I don't think even we realize it, how much that is for them to, you know, take out of their own time and out of their hearts to love another child, other people's children. The, both the senior management of Arkansas Department of Corrections and uh, the actual warden at our state women's prison, uh, they, they are all seeming to understand now that, that this is an important part of you know, the well-being of their inmates, but also of the innocent children. This is a huge motivational tool for working with parents in prison, is, is giving them better access to their children. The McPherson unit is a female facility in that maybe they don't understand why we try to, to offer the females the programming we do that maybe we're trying to be too lenient and soft on. It. And we're really not. Our job as the Department of Corrections is not to punish the individual, but to try to send the individual back to society better than he was. The punishment's done by the courts. And what we do here at the facility will influence society as a whole because most of these females are the core part of the family unit. Lord, we thank you that you, you had your presence here. Lord, we thank you that each and every child got to come, and those who didn't but had the desire to come and had no way. Lord, we thank you for giving them comfort in their heart to know it's going to be okay. My children, I know that they're going to be by my side, and I'm going to be by their side. And yes, I've missed a lot of years of their life, and I got a long way to go, you know, to miss some more years of their life. But I know that God is bringing us together. While, while I'm in here and they're out there, he's still bonding us together. When you leave the gate, we don't ever want to see you again, never. Unfortunately, we see many of them again. There is one female in there whose last time away from the Department of Correction lasted a grand total of 29 days before she came back. She is a substance abuser. I think at any given time, you can go into the back of an institution and probably 60% of the population will have been here before. You have women taking part in the parenting class who are doing their very best in class, and this isn't their first ride in the rodeo. They've been here before, and unfortunately, some of them, too many of them, will be back again. Even though each woman leaving the prison must have a parole plan in place, once they leave, they're on their own. The Department of Corrections is not responsible for rehabilitating them beyond the prison walls.
A lucky few may end up here, Second Genesis, a transitional home for women leaving prison. Second Genesis is a six-month program that helps women to find jobs and reteach them how to live in the free world. Second Genesis started with the interest of a woman named Jean Coyne, who was a chaplain at the time at Tucker Prison in Pine Bluff, the women's unit. And Jean continued to see the women who would leave and they would say, we're never coming back, we're going to make it this time. And within months, they'd be back in. And she kept asking them, what is, why are you coming back? Why is it that you can't make it out there? And generally, their answer was, if we just had some support. We go right back in to the same family, the same neighborhood, the same friends, and we get back in the same situation, which almost inevitably included either drugs, and or alcohol and or abuse. And so they wouldn't have to create a new crime or a, a perform a new crime. They would simply have to break their parole and that they could use any drugs, alcohol, that would break their parole. So they'd go back in. So she came up with the dream of if there was a place that you could go that would change your environment and give you a stay for a little while and just give you a boost. And that's really what I think we, we try to do is just give them a boost. Alicia is one of the success stories. She completed a parenting class and the program at Second Genesis and has been reunited with two of her children. If I didn't have my family and friends that I have made through the programs that I've been in, I couldn't say that I'd be where I'm at right now. And I think support is the, is the key issue. It was hard when my oldest daughter would, when are you coming home? Why can't you come home? You know, and I couldn't tell her. I couldn't tell her when because I really didn't know. Are you going to catch it? Yeah. I think one of the biggest things that I learned from Dan was once I did get my children back and get them home, that I couldn't try to make up for the time that I'd missed. They aren't the same little girls that I left two years ago. It'll come, and it has to, because we have to be able to put it behind us. We have to be able to talk about it when it bothers me or when it bothers them. I was beating myself up. I was so happy my kids were with me, but at the same time, it was tearing me apart because I could see in their faces what I'd done to them. Some of the pain that they had gone through that before was just through the telephone. It's a lot different when you see it in person. Jean Cohen said something to me one time that really touched me. She said, we're not here to reward these women for having been naughty and gone to prison. And that's the truth. We are here to help them really change and to help society be able to trust them again and, and try to bring a wholeness in what was a brokenness. The social costs of incarceration are far-reaching, but the actual economic cost of running the prison system is staggering. Our annual budget for inmate care and custody is just under $200 million a year. Corrections, and I think anyone will tell you this, correction as a whole across the nation are usually underfunded. We have more people coming to us and we have them staying longer. Every time the Capitol opens for another legislative session, there is a new push for more en enhanced penalties. So if you're going to have a total impact from a legislative session that's a light session by standards of, say, another 100 inmates a year, that's $150,000 more every year that it's going to cost us. The increase in the female prison population is a problem for both the criminal justice and child welfare systems. Arkansas and other states are experimenting with alternative sentencing for substance abusers that allows mothers and children to stay together in a treatment program 
instead of sending the mother to prison. Alternatives to prison really come before they ever get to prison. And I think things like the drug court that we have here in Little Rock and, and one in Washington County, those are important experiments, if you will, to see if, if rather than sending a woman off to prison who needs drug treatment, we keep her in her community so she can continue to care for her children, if that's going to make a great deal of difference. Drug offenders make up the bulk of our population. Maybe there is something else that can be done with those offenders and save these prison beds for the more threatening ones, the violent ones, the rapists, the murderers, the robbers, those sort of inmates. We've already got additional bed space in the works. We're building 200 more female beds at Wrightsville as fast as we can. That's part of the overall building project that we're doing, which is about 2,000 beds that will come online over the next oh, 18 months or so, maybe a little longer than that. Um, unfortunately, when those 2,000 beds come online, when they're open, they'll be full. We will fill them as fast as we can build them. And the growth rate of the female population is far outpacing that of the male population. We can't build our way out of this. There is no way Arkansas or any state can afford that. On the Friday before Mother's Day each year, thousands of people across the United States join together at rallies to call attention to women in prison and demand legislative change. Camilla, Estella, and Brenda take part in a march on the Arkansas State Capitol to tell their stories. I guess you say, well, why would I tell my story? It's not that I'm proud of what I've been through but I feel like I've gone through. And I just plead and ask to break the cycle of this because now I'm in the other aspect. I'm a grandparent raising a child of, a form of an incarcerated parent. You can come back and be all right, even though society have you as a bad person. I don't think I'm a bad person. I think that I'm a good person that made a bad choice. But you can make a bad mistake, still be a human person, still be a good person, and be all right. And that's why I tell my story. When my family finally decided they wanted to tell me, they started off by saying, Kay, I'm going to tell you something, and I don't want you to get upset. Your mother is going to a place to get herself together so she can come home and get you. There's a real, real need for the general public to understand uh, the impact that a woman's incarceration has upon her children. We need to give some real consideration to what we're doing to these children who are vulnerable to sleeping in their parents' prison beds in their own future as to whether alternatives might help break the cycle. It, it, it's the best crime prevention that I think we can uh, put together at this point. To learn more about this topic, visit our website at www.aetn.org.
The preceding program was made possible in part by a grant from the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation, Making a Difference in Arkansas.